Cool. Well, it's 11.40, so I'm going to kick it off. Uh, I'm really glad everybody's here, and I'm really excited to be here. Let's talk about Electron. So my name is Zeke. Um, Zeke on GitHub and Zeke on Twitter, if you want to get a hold of me. Uh, I'm a GitHubber. I work on the Electron team. I'm part of a team of four. Uh, I think my mom is watching this, hopefully. So I just wanted to say hi, mom. <laughs> Thanks for raising me and, and all that. <laughs> um, so I know you came to hear about Electron, um, but I kind of want to take a step back and look at the history of uh, the development of the JavaScript language and sort of look at the origins of, of, of the web and how we got to the place that we're at now. I don't have any music, but use your imagination. <laughs> Wait for it. OK. <laughs> so in 1994, uh, the Netscape browser was created. And it was the first browser to ever, uh, the first environment in which the JavaScript uh, language could run. And um, the, the first version of Netscape didn't actually have uh, support for JavaScript at all. So it was just kind of a hypertext environment um, with version 2.0, which came out in 1995. Um, it was the, the very first uh, JavaScript environment. Um, so JavaScript was created to enable web pages to behave dynamically um, to actually respond to user input and change the contents of the page or prevent users from taking certain actions. Uh, prior to this, uh, web browsers were really just sort of dumb uh, windows that, that represented content. And it was the responsibility of a server to produce that content and, and render it in the browser. So this was the very beginning of um, sort of interactivity and dynamic behaviors in browsers. Um, so Netscape grew really quickly and um, eventually had 80% share of the market. But um, of course, as we all remember, Microsoft came into the game. So um, in 1995, I believe it was, Internet Explorer uh, was released. And it came with the, uh, the, uh, the Windows 95 Plus pack. If you guys remember that, that was like a cool addition on top of Windows 95 that gave it all those extra cool features. Um, so this was the, the beginning of the so-called browser wars. This was the very first browser war between Netscape and Internet Explorer. And um, even though Netscape had uh, a lot more public goodwill than Internet Explorer at the time, um, Windows and Microsoft were this, you know, there was this monolithic uh, enterprise, and so they threw a lot of money at the effort. And um, so Windows at the time had 90% share of the desktop operating system market, uh, which is huge. And um, eventually IE overtook Netscape, and uh, in 1998, Netscape was acquired by AOL. Um, an interesting aside here is that Netscape's total revenue never exceeded the interest income of Microsoft's cash on hand. So it's really, really sort of an imbalanced uh, war. Um, I remember my dad reading a story in the newspaper about uh, Bill Gates and how his net worth was $11 billion. I don't remember when this was, but probably sometime around 98 or something like that. Um, and we calculated that if he had, uh, assuming that was all cash and he had it in a savings account at 1% interest, it would generate $300 million a day in, in interest. So you can imagine why, even though Netscape had the best intentions and was, um, by many accounts, a superior browser, they couldn't compete with, uh, with Internet Explorer and Microsoft. But they did this really awesome thing just before they were acquired by AOL. They open sourced all of the technology used to create Netscape Navigator. Um, and they started the Mozilla organization in 1998. So 
I, I'm only speculating here, but I, I assume that they knew that by being acquired by AOL, it essentially spelled the death of Netscape and that the product would probably not continue to flourish in that space. So uh, they made the wise decision of open sourcing it and putting it into this, under this organizational structure of Mozilla. So this is like really an a, a important moment in the history of uh, the development of the web, right? Like people um, recognizing the power of open source and community to um, carry a project forward into the future, regardless of what sort of corporate entities have their, their hands in it. So um, in the year 2000, also known as Y2K, uh, the Firefox browser came out, uh, 1.0. And this was like a really refreshing uh, experience, right? Like most people using the internet at this time were on Windows and they were using Internet Explorer 6 and um, uh, Microsoft had created its own um, alternative to JavaScript called JScript. And so um, there was sort of this divide where uh, if you were a web page designer, you were either making your web pages compatible with Internet Explorer, or you were making them compatible with Netscape. And um, so when Firefox came into the space, it was finally uh, uh, an open, uh, flexible, extensible browser built by people uh, that could uh, compete with, with Internet Explorer in terms of like performance and the graphical user interface and, and the flexibility. And of course it supported, it was basically uh, the next generation of the Netscape Navigator browser. Um, so in 2009, uh, the SpiderMonkey um, JavaScript compiler was added to Firefox, and this was in version 3.5 of Firefox. So prior to, to this, um, all JavaScript in the web browsers was interpreted at runtime, and it was um, pretty slow. So if you imagine a lot of things that you do on web browsers today where uh, you can dynamically with JavaScript, like with React, for example, you can manipulate to the contents of the entire page and uh, create a bunch of elements and remove a bunch of elements and move them around. At this time, if you had 10 elements on the page and you wanted to, to re-render them or change their content, you would bring your computer to a crawl. The, the JavaScript performance in browsers was devastatingly slow. It could only do really basic things like form validation. But when SpiderMonkey came along, all of a sudden the JavaScript performance was depending on how you count, like 20 to 40 times faster. So this was the first just-in-time compiler that ever, uh, for JavaScript that ever existed. Um, and shortly after that, uh, Chrome came into being from Google. I don't know if you all remember how this logo looked. So when, this, when, they cha when Chrome changed the logo from this to the flat thing that it is now, I was really mad and I was like, I'm never gonna like this, this is so ugly. But now I see this, and this looks really ugly to me. So <laughs> I think we all just need a little bit of time to adjust, I guess. <laughs> um, so Chrome saw the value of the browser um, and got in the game. This was in 2008. Um, Chrome obviously is really popular now. It has 62% 60, worldwide usage on desktop and 50% market share on, um, across all platforms, including mobile. So it's definitely the dominant browser of today. Um, Chrome has uh, an open source basis called Chromium. So uh, Chromium is, is the majority of the Chrome web browser minus the Google specific aspects of the browser that you're familiar with. So uh, it was a wise choice on the part of Google to, to open source this early. So, Google recognized that you know, speed matters and um, one of the most important aspects of your product is that it's fast, especially like in the web browsing space or the search space. So uh, they hired a, a team to work on this new um, JavaScript engine called V8. This was in, I think this was also in 2009. Um, so V8 was, came out of the gate faster than SpiderMonkey and has continued to um, dominate the JavaScript performance space. Uh, it's still the fastest JavaScript uh, engine out there. So, um, 
at this time, I'm talking around 2009, um, if you were a JavaScript developer or if you were a web developer, you're kind of like in this isolated space where you could really only make web pages and you couldn't really do a lot to, to make them interactive or you couldn't really um, create an entire web application. So on the left here you see JavaScript, on the right you see all these other languages and the languages on the right are the ones that were used to create to, to create servers, to create web applications. So typically this would be two different teams or two different people working on these, uh, working on these web applications. So you'd have the person who knows JavaScript who is uh, <laughs> building the, web, the, the actual web page and putting together DOM elements and things like that, doing some of the design work. And then you have these other people who are making the servers. And so there's this kind of like, there was this human bottleneck, right, where um, an individual was not necessarily empowered to create a, a cohesive applica web application or just any kind of app experience. Um, so it was kind of, kind of a sad time. I mean, obviously, people are adaptive and you could, of course, learn JavaScript and one of these other languages as well, but it meant learning an entirely new language, a new, a new ecosystem, a new set of tools, um, and everything that goes along with that. So it was no small feat to become a full stack developer at this time. You have to learn a lot of different technologies. So this is where everything gets crazy, right? Like this is like, this is the pivotal moment when Node.js comes out. So um, Node.js is, is at its essence a way to run JavaScript outside of the web browser. So prior to the creation of Node.js in 2009, web browsers were the only environment where JavaScript was run. And that's not entirely true, but there were ways to, to run it outside of the browser, but people didn't do it, and it wasn't easy to do, and it wasn't practical. And people still thought of JavaScript as a toy language or a language that was really underpowered. So when Node.js was created, it, it was just a way to run JavaScript and do lots of different things with a computer, like using the, uh, the file system module for accessing all the files on a user's computer, or using the, the net module to create a, a web server, or the HTTP module to just make uh, hypertext requests, um, or the process module to access uh, the environment variables on a computer. So, um, all these new sort of tools and frameworks and ideas started popping up when Node.js came out. So JavaScript was no longer shackled to this uh, sort of underpowered browser environment. It was all of a sudden just like whatever you can imagine using JavaScript for, like go for it. You can now do it. Um, Node.js now has about three and a half million users um, and that's growing 100% every year for the last three years. Um, so the community is, is growing really rapidly. I don't know who created this graphic, but I feel like it really encapsulates the feeling of what Node.js did for JavaScript. Um, so in order to really sort of appreciate or understand the value of Node, you have to kind of know about NPM. And NPM is the package manager that, that is included with Node. So if you download Node, you get this NPM command line thing for free along with it. Um, NPM is a, a package registry for um, packaging up little pieces of JavaScript and sharing them with the world. So there are currently 340,000 plus packages on NPM. Um, and there are 400 new packages every day. Granted, these aren't all useful. <laughs> and they aren't all uh, something that you necessarily will need to use, but it gives you a sense of how rapidly the ecosystem is growing. And uh, I think one of the big reasons for this was the simplicity around the design of, of NPM. So um, you have this file called package.json. And a package.json file, unlike a lot of other programming languages, is this convention. It's this, it's this file where you basically describe um, all the sort of fundamental aspects of your module, your application, your library, whatever your, your project, whatever you're calling it. Your name, the description, the, rep the repository, uh, the list of dependencies, development dependencies, things like that. So when you're working on a, uh, when you're working on a, a 
a JavaScript project nowadays, you just have this canonical place you can go in a project to see like, how does this thing work? What's the gist of it? What does it depend on? What version of Node does it need? So creating packages in NPM is really, is really easy. You create a package.json, and you use this NPM thing to just type NPM publish, and all of a sudden your package is, is in the registry. So the barrier to entry is really low. Um, and there's, there's a lot of different things about NPM that we could talk about, but the gist is it lowered the barrier to entry for JavaScript and made it really easy for people to share and distribute code. So here's just a sampling of some um, Node modules. This is kind of representative of um, the community that's grown around Node. You'll see a lot of Node school patches in there. Um, NodeSchool.io is a great place to, to go to learn about Node in general and how to get started with it. Um, there are all these Node School chapters around the world that, that teach people how to use Node. I know I still haven't mentioned Electron, so you guys are probably like, what, what's the deal? But this is really, I mean, this is really sort of fundamental to what Electron is. Like, knowing how to use Electron, you need to know how to use Node and you need to know about NPM because they are essential to what Electron is. So just kind of a high level view of what we just talked about. This is sort of um, a 30 year span of the, the development of the web and the development of JavaScript. So this space between Node and Electron, in my mind, is really the most exciting time because it's when JavaScript moved out of the browser and had a chance to flourish and, and be used for all these other things like command line interfaces and servers and now it's, it's you know, a, a big part of the, this sort of Internet of Things phenomenon. It's embedded on devices. So Electron is just coming in at this really perfect time. So what is Electron? This is the blurb that you see on the website, and I'm sure everybody's already heard this before. Um, but it's exciting, right? Like, uh, You've never been able to do this before. You've never been able to make native apps on a desktop with open web technologies. If you wanted to be, become a Mac developer, you had to learn uh, Objective-C or Swift, and you have to use Xcode, and you have to, there's a lot of, you basically have to become sort of indoctrinated into that world. And the same thing applies to Windows. So what Electron is doing is trying to break that down so that if you were a lowly web designer, all of a sudden you can now become a desktop app developer. So that's pretty exciting. So at its essence, this is what Electron is. It's a mixture of Chromium and Node. So it's a web browser. It's like Node had all this time to, to fork off from the browser and flourish and the, 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 the community developed and 350,000 packages were published and you know, billions of downloads every however so often. <laughs> And now Node comes back into the browser. That's, that's what Electron is. So this is a really happy time. Like, we're living in the golden age of JavaScript right now. So like I said, you can deploy or publish or package uh, Electron apps to Mac, Windows, and Linux platforms using a common code base. So for Companies, this makes a ton of sense because they don't have to outsource or you know, don't have to farm out to work to a, a Mac shop and a Windows shop. Um, they can just, a, a lot of companies already have you know, a web development team, so all of a sudden your web, web development team is capable of making desktop applications. Um, you can distribute your, your apps on the Mac App Store. And uh, so this, this slide is actually the Electron APIs demo app, which is something definitely worth checking out. Um, it's, a, it's an app that was made by the Electron team. Um, my partner in crime, Jay Lord in particular, uh, Jessica Lord, created it. And it, it walks through um, some of the, the sort of core fundamental APIs of Electron, how to use them. This is the Windows Store, which can also be released to. So Windows has this thing with Windows 10, I think it started actually with Windows 8, but Windows 10 has um, this uh, thing called the Universal Windows Platform. And this is sort of still coming together uh, in the Electron space, so it's not totally 
like a turnkey thing right now. But um, the gist of it is that you can develop apps for the universal Windows platform, and you're just writing one code base, and it can, it's a single app package that can run on uh, PCs, tablets, phones, Xboxes, et cetera. So they're, going in, they're moving into this space where you don't have to know a different set of technologies for each type of hardware, Windows hardware that you're dealing with. So that's pretty exciting. There's a ton of Electron apps. This is just a collection of some of the ones that are featured on the, uh, the Electron website right now. Um, it's just a silly little animation of my doc full of Electron apps. Um, this is Moji Bar. It's one of my favorite um, Electron apps. It's, it's, it's a menu bar app. So um, there are a lot of different manifestations of, of what an Electron app can be. So it doesn't necessarily have to be an app with a, a, an icon in the, in the dock or in the status bar. Um, it can also be something more discreet, like a little icon on the top of your screen. Um, so Moji Bar is really just this, uh, to play it again, this really basic um, interface and can be driven entirely by uh, the keyboard. So um, if you're a programmer, and I think a lot of you probably are, you're really fond of things that can be driven entirely with the keyboard and not having to use the mouse. So uh, cheers to Moan for making this really useful emoji interface. Um, this is an app with a name that I don't know how to pronounce. Uh, I want to call it Spegasus, <laughs> but it's S-V-G-S-U-S. -S. Um, so coming up here, there's a little animation where you actually drop a file, you carry a file through this application window. It is sanitized as you drop it, as you carry it through the window, and then you drop it on another target window. So that's an interaction that I've never actually seen before. Um, in a desktop application. Like, so there's some really interesting things you can do with Electron where you have multiple windows and you have like pretty much complete control over the behavior of dragging things in and out of Windows files and text content, stuff like that. Um, another thing that was in that video there, I'll play it again, is uh, SVG SUS has this feature where it's just watching your file system in a particular directory for um, changes in the files. So it's kind of an illustration of um, how, because you have Node, you can, you can watch the file system. You can watch a particular directory and sync changes. So this is the kind of thing that you could never do in the browser environment. Like, never had this kind of access to a user's uh, machine. Um, so it's really powerful. Another thing um, that's worth noting is you can make, um, your Electron apps don't necessarily have to have a visual interface. Um, like, when you think of a desktop app, you're probably picturing a window that fills the screen and has a little close button and things like that. But you can actually make an Electron app that uh, is invisible to the user once you run it. Um, it's just a, something that's running in the background. So um, it's important to realize that there are actually Lots of things you can do with Electron that aren't necessarily just rendering content inside of a web page. Um, also, Electron gives you these really nice hooks for making an app start at system startup or when the user logs in or when they log out. And, um, so if you want to have some team and it's consistently running as long as the computer's user is running, you can do that. It's really easy. With just regular Node, you can do that too, but it's actually pretty hard, and Electron provides some nice cushy APIs for doing this kind of stuff. So let's talk about uh, how to make a, a very basic Electron application. Um, the first thing you need to do if you haven't done it already is go to nodejs.org and install Node. So like I said earlier, when you install Node, you get NPM with that um, included in the installation. If you're at that website now and you see there's a version 4.5 and a version 6.5, or somewhere around there, which, which one should you use? It doesn't actually really matter. If you use six, you'll get all the new shiny features, but uh, they're both perfectly compatible with Electron, um, so take your pick. Also, if you're on an older version of Node, like Node 0.10, you can still use Electron. 
And once you install Electron, you get all the goodies that come with Electron, and they're kind of separate from Node. So shout out to DuckDuckGo, the search engine that doesn't track you. Um, slight tangent. DuckDuckGo is awesome. Like, it used to not be very good, but it's actually pretty good now. Um, if you want to skip the, like, if you want just the gist of how to create an Electron app without following these slides, just search for Electron Quick Start. Obviously, this will work on Google, too, but, um, but you know, we've already given Google enough love already uh, today. So um, here's a series of commands that will um, set you up for creating an Electron app. So you create a directory called demo. You, you uh, change into that directory. You run npm init. And npm init is uh, it's a, a little command line wizard that walks you through the process of creating a package.json file for your project. So it says, what's the name of your project? What's the description of your project in it? It, as it asks you a lot of questions, and it can be kind of annoying at first, but it's really a, a useful exercise because at the end of it, you have a package.json that really describes what your project is, and it's, it's a publish-ready package at that point. Like, if you were to do npm publish, you'd have all the, the appropriate metadata, like the repository, the description, the homepage, keywords, dependencies, and things like that listed in your package.json. So, the next thing is you install Electron and you add the save dev flag, which will save it as a dev dependency in your package.json as opposed to a regular uh, dependency. So if you've been doing Electron development for a while, Electron is just the new name of Electron pre-built. It's, it's the same package. You can still use pre-built, but only through the end of 2016, we're phasing it out, and Electron is now the, the canonical package that you install. Uh, then we're just, you just create two files. There's a main.js is the convention for um, what most people call this main JavaScript file and index.html. Um, so we're creating just a, uh, like a web browser window. So this is what a main.js file looks like. Um, some of that syntax might be a little bit uh, intimidating, but it's actually pretty cool once you start to familiarize yourself with it. So const is a way to create a variable. It's a new thing in ES6 or ES 2015 that allows you to uh, create a variable that cannot change. It's a constant. So once you've set that, you can't inadvertently change the value of it. And on this first line that says const app and browser window, that's actually plucking objects off of the, the electron module it's like we're just saying we want app and browser window. Those are the things, those are the pieces of Electron that we need for, for this particular context. Uh, and then when the app is ready, we're just creating a browser window and loading a URL, which is really just a file URL, to our local index file. So the main file is really the thing that is controlling the application lifecycle, like what the, what the application does when it boots up or when it starts, uh, what it does when it... Um, quits, things like that, um, uh, whether or not it should appear in the dock or the, the taskbar, um, whether or not it should have a menu bar icon, things like that. So operating system level stuff is usually managed in this main.js file. Then in our index.html, this is kind of a crude, this is a, just a kind of an exercise to demonstrate what you can do, not really that useful, but um, this slide really captures what's so crazy about Electron, is that you're in an HTML file, you're just writing regular old HTML code and JavaScript, and then all of a sudden you put in this require statement, and you can bring in any node module under the sun into this environment and execute it in your web page, which is just like, it's so insane, it's so cool. So, um, especially if you've been doing this stuff for a while, like, Ah, oh, it's just, it's finally good. Um, so what this script is doing is, um, it's bringing in some node core modules. These, it doesn't have to be node core modules. You could have modules that you installed from NPM too, but uh, file system and operating system are two things that just come with node for free. So what we're doing here is we're grabbing a list of files in the user's home directory and rendering them to the page. So it's not super useful, but it's a, it's a simple uh, demonstration of the fact that we're able to just like reach onto the file system and do things and display them in a web page. 
And so this is kind of the MVP, the, the, the very most basic demonstration of the power of, of the Electron uh, web browser window. So convention says in NPM and Node world that um, you should define a start script. So there's this object called scripts. And um, the way you start an app is Electron and the path to the directory where your Electron app lives. Um, there's actually something missing here, which is the, an entry called main, which describes where the, the sort of entry point for your app. So we should have something in here that says main, and the value is main.js. Then you npm start, and you've got a running app. I don't actually have a screenshot of it, but you can get the idea. So let's talk about some of the goodies that you get for free uh, with Electron. So dev tools. Um, I'm going to do a live demo here, famous last words. Um, so you see that I'm in, where's my mouse? There it is. These are some of my notes, clear that. So it's just a browser window. Like it looks like an app, but it's just really a Chrome browser window. So I can do all kinds of stuff in here, like that same uh, demo that we just did. Now I have access to everything in the operating system. That tells, tells me how much free memory is, is available, or tells me what the home directory is on this. And this is really useful for like cross, doing cross-platform work because um, on Windows, obviously, it's not going to be slash users that's like the default directory path for the user uh, directory. So Node has a lot of these baked in things for like normalizing paths across operating systems. So you can make um, things that behave in a cross-platform way. So assuming you had installed NP any uh, NPM modules, you just have access to them right here in this browser window and you can require them and do whatever you want with them. Um, and then you still have like the element inspector, so you can still go into your code and make all kinds of changes. And um, so if you're accustomed to doing web development, it's like the same, it's the same flow, it just has node added to it. So ES2015, I think Chromium includes Chromium and Node 6, which are uh, Chromium, what are we at? 52, I think, right now. Uh, in Electron and Node 6.5-ish or something like that. They both have nearly full support for ES2015. So you don't actually have to use like a transpiler like Babel or, or anything like that to, to write a uh, new JavaScript in your, in your apps. You just, you just write it and it works. Um, you can, of course, bring in those transpilers. You can bring in these tools for, if you want to write something in TypeScript, you can just bring in TypeScript and write your code that way. Um, but you don't have to. So you get a really pretty, um, pretty powerful environment out of the gate without having to install any extra dependencies. Uh, geolocation, um, a special thing about this is just that you can, you can get the user's location um, without having to ask for it, which is maybe a little bit scary, but um, not for you as the developer. Uh, <laughs> Um, and this is nothing new to desktop apps, right? Desktop apps have always been, had this kind of uh, power to, to make these kinds of um, inquiries into the, the user's system. Um, so it's the same thing that you would do. Uh, it's like navigator.geolocation.getCurrentPosition and that, and that um, makes a, a web request to get your, uh, your latitude, longitude, altitude, all those kinds of things. Um, and you can have this continually running in the background if you want. Webcam, a lot of this is just HTML5 technologies, but because um, as web developers, you have, to do, you have to think of all of the possible consumers of your application or of, of, your, of your web app, right? So if it doesn't work on Internet Explorer, you're out of luck. Or if it doesn't work on an older version of Firefox or I guess they say Safari is the new Internet Explorer. So if it doesn't work on Safari, you're out of luck. Um, with Electron, you don't have to worry about those th kinds of things. Like the webcam, just it just works. Like you have all the get user media features. You also, just like uh, with geolocation, you don't have to ask for it. You can just 
turn on the webcam. Same thing with microphone. Uh, we have all these new WebRTC features coming in. Um, so this allows people to do, uh, to make peer-to-peer -peer applications that are not dependent on a server. So really exciting things there. Um, CSS custom properties, if you're familiar with uh, SAS or, or LESS or some of those other um, CSS preprocessors, um, there's this concept of variables. So if you want to uh, define a color or a width or a font family or something like that and you want to um, keep your style sheets dry, uh, typically you would use the preprocessed language uh, to do that. But CSS custom properties actually allow you to do that um, with just vanilla CSS. So this is a part of the CSS spec that's now in Chromium. Um, so it gives you a lot of flexibility. And you can actually, an interesting thing that, uh, is different, that makes it different from, CS, from SAS and LESS is that you can actually manipulate these properties with JavaScript. So before, there used to be this sort of divide between JavaScript and CSS, like you couldn't really reach across uh, from one to the other and make changes. But now, because CSS custom properties are just an attribute like any other attribute in an HTML file, you can manipulate them with JavaScript at runtime. So all of a sudden, your JavaScript has way more control over the way the CSS behaves. So it's really exciting. Uh, CSS containment is just a way to, um, if you're working on games or things that really need high performance uh, video, then you, CSS containment is this new feature that allows you to uh, very specifically control which pieces of your application or which pieces of your DOM are rendered and how. Window.fetch, you just get, it's an HTTP client that you get that's, that has promises that you get for free that's just on the window object. No more cores, which is like, <laughs> if you guys have ever done any web development where you're trying to like make an Ajax request to some other site, like you hit this cores thing and it's just like, so sad, but that's, that's over now. Async await. Um, so one of the biggest hurdles for working with JavaScript, uh, especially for new developers, is just getting accustomed to the asynchronous style of the language where you have to pass around these callbacks and things. Um, understanding the flow of an application can be kind of difficult. Newer versions of, of Chromium are actually supporting this thing called async await, so you can actually write code that appears to be synchronous and is a lot more human friendly. But under the hood, it's actually doing the asynchronous dance. So you get all the benefits, the performance benefits of the event-driven design um, in a, in a human-friendly, readable interface. HTML imports, um, they just allow you to uh, write HTML files that you can bring into another HTML file, like a partial. Um, this has kind of been around for a while, but again, this is a thing where you can't use it in all browsers, so you just don't use it. Um, but now you can. Desktop notifications, these are native um, push notifications. So this allows a web service to push a, uh, a notification to a user's device. Um, and so this is baked into Chrome now too. So these are all things that we get for free. Totally running out of time. I didn't think that was gonna happen. Um, web audio, that's like really cool. <laughs> You can, you can control the mouse and the keyboard using this, this uh, module called Robot.js. So you can programmatically move the mouse around, type things on the keyboard, completely control a computer that way. Uh, there's lots of stuff. So navigating user space. There's 10,000 repos on GitHub right now um, that depend on Electron. Uh, that's pretty exciting. I did a little diving in to figure out what they're up to. Um, I don't know if you can read that, but this is a list of the top dependencies. React is wildly popular in the Electron space. Um, dev dependencies, you can see there's a lot of babble going on. People really want their super futuristic JavaScript. I can't blame them. Um, top fork taps, only have 45 seconds. Okay, this is a good one. This is a good one for you to know about. So try module is my favorite node module. You install it globally. And then when you type try module and the name of a module, it opens up a, a, a REPL, an interactive console, with that uh, module loaded for you. So whenever you're trying out a new module, you can just um, open up this REPL and figure out if it works for your use cases. Um, it's really fast. So 
1,000 NPM packages. That means there are 1,000 packages on NPM that are related to Electron in some way, and they're, they're uh, encapsulated in this, uh, this Electron NPM packages module. Um, Electron.atom.io is the, the place to go to get started to find out about everything Electron. Um, awesome Electron is this repository. If you're not familiar with uh, the awesome phenomenon, it's this thing on GitHub where people create basically just a readme file that is a list of awesome things about a particular topic, and it's usually web development related. So Awesome Electron is this constantly updated list of interesting Electron projects, apps, boilerplates, videos, things like that. NPMS is an alternative search interface for NPM. If you've ever tried to find modules on NPM, the search is not good. Uh, this is better. Uh, ghub.io is just a tiny web service where you go to ghub.io slash module name, and it tries to figure out what the repository URLs for that package is and takes you to GitHub instead of to NPM. So GitHub is often a better place to evaluate a package than NPM because you can find out how actively the, the project is maintained, how many contributors it has, how many pull requests it has, things like that. Um, Electron Electron is the place to go for uh, the, the repository, that is github.com Electron Electron, just for filing issues. Um, we have a Slack channel. We have a Twitter account. We have a team, awesome team. Those are our GitHub handles. Thank you. Uh, one more thing. After lunch, I'm going to be over at the open source help desk. So if anybody has questions about Electron, Node, any of those things, you can find me there. Thanks.